Welcome to another lively edition of The Deadly Experiment. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, this is an interesting program today that we are putting forth, and this is being done at the time, well, around the time, maybe following the time, of the anniversary of 70 years of terror in the Middle East by the bad or evil fig tree that Jesus denounced quite explicitly to his apostles that was planted in 1948. Now, we hear all propaganda all day and all night from the bought and paid for corrupt media. And that it is. You know it by their fruits. The fact that, as we've talked about in the past programs about the Syrian situation, how what you will get is nothing more than demonization of the incumbent government you will get vilification, you will get obfuscation, smears, lies, falsification, and most of all, omission. You will not get the entire picture or even a part of the picture. What you will get is a distorted picture. It's like looking through a lens and you see a distorted image and you can't quite fo focus in on that image. You can't get anything even near to a crystal clear image of reality. What you get is fog, you get a little fungus in the lens, and then you have distortion. You have an unclear picture. And that's the way the media and the government, that is Intel, work together. Now, it just so happens that in recent polls, apparently 74% of the American public believes in deep state. Deep state is, of course, Intel, and it is deeper than deep, deep state, the likes of which most people don't know. Why? Because they have no clear lens. They don't understand. Why? Because the media will not allow them to know that. Going back to good journalists like H.L. Mencken, going back decades, and indeed a half a century, three quarters of a century ago, you had to find men like him in Gary Garrett who wrote the book, The People's Pottage. These were true journalists. They were people who understood news from fiction, real news. And what you get today is fake news, as Mr. Trump eloquate, eloquently stated it right from the beginning. And then, of course, he himself <laughs> turned out to be a faker. Why? Because all people who were put into office at that level either have to answer to that deep state or they will be eliminated one way or another. We saw that with McKinley going way back to the early part of the 20th century. He was assassinated. One of the things that made him an assassin's target was the fact that he opposed the bankster, gangster, criminal elite who were trying to bring about their Federal Reserve System, and they finally got it in 1913, along with the income tax and the direct election of senators three cornerstones of a whole new philosophy and way of life in America that would doom her destiny. The income tax, and of course, this privately run Federal Reserve System that McKinley opposed, and he paid for it with his life. And most of all, the direct election of senators. Prior to that, senators, U.S. senators, were not elected. They were appointed by whom? By the legislature by the states. Why? Why did the Founding Fathers say that? Because the legislature would maintain state sovereignty over the federal government and ward off all of the powerful special interests who could simply buy a presidency, as they have, simply install a senator, as they have with Jack Reed, the Ripper Reed, or whatever, and uh, White House. Two clowns, two buffoons. I think most people will agree with that. They are nothing more than bumps on a law, and very large bumps at that. Folks, we passed that point of no return in 1913, when America was being set up to become an empire, after Britain was relinquishing her empire status. And that's where people like Churchill came about. Churchill, who was a consummate demagogue and warmonger. Yet in World War I, uh, he talked very clearly about the Zionist influence in the Bolshevik Revolution into being evil, and them being evil, those who called themselves Jews. Now, something happened between World War I and World War II, where he was bought off, paid off, 
and totally installed in office. Why? Because he was a gambler. He was a womanizer. He was a drunk. He was a member of uh, some rather notorious secret societies, the Hellfire Club, for one. So he became prey in the hands of the Rothschild banking conglomerates in Europe. He became their little puppet boy, just as Trump and just as Obama and all the others came about, because the American people don't know any better. They simply don't have information because the media lie. So we have the poor suffering today as never before. The rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, the poor Syrian people, the poor Iraqi people, the poor Afghani people, the poor people in all of these countries. Iran is not one of them, even though it has been hit with devastating sanctions. It has a very highly educated population, and I dare say that sixth graders in Iran compare very highly, in fact, most assiduously, with the American college student. Can you believe that? Sixth graders are highly literate in the Iranian school system. And that come, comes from various people, including Professor William O. Beeman, who was a professor at Brown University, then UMN, and now, of course, he's on leave from Stanford University. So you have to understand that people are suffering today while others are doing quite well, thank you. The Gina Rahimondos, people like that, and of course the, uh, you know, the Steve Mnuchins and the bankster gangsters at the Federal Reserve System, those powerful elites, the members of Congress who dined sumptuously from that table, like the rich man who went to the bad side of the Gulf, as opposed to Lazarus, who was the poor soul who suffered all of his life. See, there is a day of justice and judgment to come. And that day is going to come and hit like a thief in the night. You know, in the Psalms again, we go back to King David. King David said in, uh, I think it's Psalm 9 here, in chapter 9, verse 16. And he's talking in that chapter about the wicked. He says, the wicked soul is snared in the work of his own hands. His own hands will destroy him. God's justice, you see. For the wicked God hateth, of course. And God loveth a righteous soul. And he says, the wicked shall be turned into hell. And all the nations that forget God. For the needy, that is the poor, shall not always be forgotten. Wow, did you hear that? The needy, the poor, the humble, the meek, they shall not be forgotten by God. Right now it seems that way, doesn't it? It seems like God doesn't care, but he does. You have to find favor with God, first of all, as an individual. You have to approach God's throne in the name of Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And he will answer your prayers. He won't give you everything you want. But he'll give you what's according to his will for you. Why? Because he knows what's best for you. He knows what's right for you. You don't. You don't want riches. You don't want riches. Because along with riches comes more problem. More debt. Because like the government of Rhode Island under these corrupt, filthy politicians, too much is never enough. Give them a billion dollars today, and they'll spend it tomorrow. And there'll be another billion in debt. It's the insatiable appetite of government for more and more money. It never ends, and it never can end. That's the nature of filthy politicians, to pander to the people out there and the crowds and the we call them, you know, the little, you know, the little old Pied Piper's dream, if you will. You call it what you want. But the mob, the mob install. They always do, the politicians. And then the politicians pander to the mobs. The mobs of corrupt people. The mobs of never, never satisfied people. We heard that program, Honoria, years ago. Taylor Caldwell's story of the fall of America paralleling the fall of ancient Rome. Almost to a flawless T. Hard to imagine. And yet, we are replicating that history as never before. We are a welfare warfare state, and people are not happy. Suicides are at an all-time high. America is fighting America with itself. 
And that's, of course, what God said would happen. He said it in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. He said, you've ceased to worship me, you've thrown me out of your institutions, and now I'm going to send you the curses. No more blessings. It's going to be America the cursed. Folks, you better wake up to that fact. There's no turning back. It's over. I don't care who you put in as governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state. I don't care the treasurer. It's one big fat joke. Some of you are watching right now and gnashing your teeth. But you'll be gnashing your teeth on Judgment Day, too. And a lot of wailing will take place if you don't repent and turn around. Because God is in control of both the negative and the positive. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, and a people, and a nation, that also shall they reap. God is on his throne, and he's not happy with this country, nor is he happy with this world. All of that evil that we see about us today is emanating from God's wrath upon us. Because he says that he will pour out his wrath upon all the nations of the world, not just Israel, that phony regime in the Middle East, or America, true Israel here today, the land between two great waters or rivers, meaning oceans, the land of an unwalled people. That's the new Jerusalem that the prophet spoke about when they left Assyrian captivity. The ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel, if you know anything about true Israel, they crossed over the Caucasus Mountains. They went to Europe. They went to New Zealand, Australia. They, they traveled across to North America and America. That's secular history. Well, let's put it back up. Can't help it. I'm getting so excited, folks, because <laughs> these are the times of the end. America has a destiny to fulfill. Russia also has a destiny to fulfill. Both are going to clash very shortly, as it says in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Who are the children of Edom, and who are the children of that generation that would cross with this generation today in this time of Bible prophecy? The Edomians, Esau, God hated, he said, while he was still in his mother's belly. In Genesis 25 and verses 23 onward, why would he hate a little baby in a womb? Well, he hates the baby because of the previous age that existed in which that generation did the same thing, though not in flesh bodies. They did it before. Otherwise, it makes no sense. You see, the Bible makes sense when you understand the meaning of it and the true interpretation of it. So that generation then that existed in the first earth and heaven age, that existed way before this one, where dinosaurs roamed the earth and so forth, that no longer exists. But you can see the evidence of them. That's why we have tundra and flowers glowing, you know, where Alaska is today. Then we have elephant tusks in places like uh, uh, Iowa. You know, the Teutonic plates have shifted. And now we're seeing evidence of earthquakes almost every day across the globe, earthquakes in diverse places, as the Bible says it would be in this last generation. So in order to understand why we are where we are today, we have to understand why everything is totally and completely in the hands of God. He hates Cain. He hates Cain's seed line. That's why he says he will destroy Jerusalem when he comes, when Jesus comes with a sword on a white horse. Satan comes on a little white horse too, but it's a fake He's a faker, and he's coming to bring fake peace to the Middle East and to the world. When they sign that peace treaty in Syria, then you'll know that all bets are off. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, like travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape the wrath of God, because it's a fake peace, and a fake peacemaker, a fake Jesus who's coming. Rhode Island is a classic example with gun control legislation, all sorts of nonsensical bills. We had the land management, comprehensive land management bill in the 1980s that was defeated as a, an omnibus bill. It was a totally obnoxious bill. And it came from the state planning commissioner and people like Varon, people who were pushing the agenda through the legislature. There were many people opposed to it. I was one of them. And we killed the bill. We killed it as a 
an entire omnibus piece of legislation, but portions of it today have actually come to be. Land management, land control under the state, land use regulations, Agenda 21, all of these facets of this new world order are here in Rhode Island because Rhode Island actually represents the mafia. I mean the Cosa Nostra mafia. It is a test case state for not only truck tolls and residential and motorist tolls, but we're going to see an incredible, incredible tax burden that will absolutely dwarf anything you've imagined in the past. Rhode Island went from not even a billion dollar budget in my lifetime. In fact, it was not even three quarters of a billion to a $9.45 billion budget. Pension liabilities are just totally out of control. They cannot be funded. They're unfunded and there is nothing that can save them unless you have a total and complete 100% tax bill and then everything collapses. So you see, the system is designed to collapse. It all started with the Federal Reserve System in 1913, direct election of senators and an income tax. Let the rich fellows pay, said the silly citizens who thought it was going to be on corporations and the rich and the wealthy. And in fact, it is devouring what's left of the very, very shrinking middle class. But history is not known to people because they don't know history. We have met the enemy and he is us, friends. Democracy always destroys freedom. When you become a democracy from a Republican form of government, that is the rule of law, then you become a dictatorship. Democracy means majoritarian rule. Majoritarianism is a form of big government control. It is not the will of the people, quite the contrary. When you leave a democracy and then you head into a, an empire like we have become today, you know that's the last stop before total and complete destruction from within, as was the case with Rome. So we've had people who have protested in the past, men that I've known, people that I've walked and watched. We had A&T Company in uh, Warwick, East Greenwich, um, the Timperley family that ran a machine shop and they would not pay income taxes on constitutional grounds. And Lincoln Allman was the U.S. attorney then. He walked in, the man went to his drawer to get his revolver to defend himself, and they put the handcuffs on him and carted him away and went to federal court. We had the case of Charles Morse. Charles Morse, who was uh, one of those who just despised the Clintons. And Senator John Chafee was senator then. And he reported to the FBI and to the Secret Service that Mr. Morse had actually threatened Mr. Clinton. Well, he didn't. He wished ill on him, which is what most people, I think, did at the time and, and what we have seen in subsequent years. That's a normal reaction to evil up, uh, upon our nation. So he was cleared. He had to go to psychiatric counseling, of course, but it was Mr. John Chafee, not Lincoln Chafee, but Senator Chafee, who handed it over to the government because Mr. Morse complained to Mr. Chafee and in a letter suggested that Mr. Clinton was worthy of death. Well, most of these presidents are worthy of death for the crimes they have committed, the Bush family in particular. And of course, Barbara Bush's husband, George Bush, is one of the most notable of all criminal elites head of the CIA, congressman from Texas. Here's a guy who represented the synagogue of Satan at the highest levels. And his son, W, who brought about the suffering, the emasculation of the people of Iraq, Afghanistan, throughout the Middle East, to his chagrin and his shame. But he's a Bible-believing Christian, isn't he? See, God will separate the righteous from the unrighteous, as it says in Psalms, the evil from the good. And he will exact his judgment. When he comes, the day of the Lord is going to be the beginning of the millennium. But the final judgment, it tells us in the book of Revelation, does not come until the great white throne judgment opens up, where God Almighty will pass sentence on all souls, the rich and the poor, the mighty and the small. You don't want to be one of those mighty in ego and pride and vanity and defiance against God, because you're going to be history. Of that you can be sure. Right now I want to pause for a brief video in our program 
that will give you a little more insight as to who the enemies are and what we are facing in these last days today. Israel's shopworn mantra about its right to defend itself is the same old Orwellian doublespeak thrown in our faces 24-7 as Israel ignites Gaza into a funeral pyre of burned corpses of Palestinian children, women, and men. It's not only the Jewish-owned press touting the big lie, Israel's right of self-defense, but the masses boy in the White House who has been vomiting out the same old line of Zionist propaganda. Tell me, please, how are some homemade rockets, either shot down by Israel's Iron Dome or falling on cement curbs in the suburbs of Tel Aviv, an excuse for Israel to go on another high-tech death spree on a civilian population in Gaza? How can a batch of do-it-yourself, crude, primitive rockets pose any kind of threat to the world's third-ranking thermonuclear power? Here's Israel alongside the Mediterranean Ocean. It's about the size of New Jersey, seven and a half million people, 75% Jewish. The economy is good, unemployment below 7% right now. Gaza, by comparison, quite small. Geographically, only twice as big as Washington, D.C. It is predominantly Palestinian. The unemployment rate is very high there, and the economy is quite bad. Globalfirepower.com has called Israel the 10th most powerful military in the world. So let's break that down. Here. They have compulsory military service, which means that every young person must go into the military for a while. So they have 176,000 active troops, a half million, they can call it from the reserves if need be. Ground force is very strong, about 3,000 tanks. If you count all the mortars, artillery units, and armored personnel carriers, you get up to about 12,000 units on the ground that they can call up. And of course, their military is very formidable. About 800 aircraft, including some 200 helicopters, that's what they largely use to pound away at their perceived enemies over in Gaza. Now, if you look at the forces that Hamas has, very, very different picture. If you take almost everybody under uniform there officially, you get about 12,500 troops and, of course, nothing like the weapons that they have over here. But Palestinian militants do have a lot of rockets. You hear about them all the time and that's what's making the news. Let me bring in a model of one here, life-size actually. This is a Qassam II rocket. These are popular because they are cheap and easy to make out of steel tubes. They only weigh about 70 to 100 pounds and they're fueled essentially by fertilizer, ammonium nitrate, and they can pack quite a punch. They're not very accurate. Just how are these unguided rockets fueled by fertilizer? Some probably false flag rockets fired by Jews at themselves justification for this latest American taxpayer-paid genocide of Palestinians. The Jews stole their land, bombed their homes, take their water, drone their skies, kill their children, close their borders on land and sea, herd them into an open-air concentration camp, and rain living hell down upon them. And Israel is the good guy? Noam Chomsky got it right. With Israel dropping white phosphorus bombs on an occupied population that has no air force, no standing army, no tanks or armor, no central command, this isn't war, it's murder. AIPAC is dancing with glee today, and its Goyim shills on Capitol Hill are dancing the horror to the tune of Jewry's Hava Nagila, which means, let us rejoice. But there's no rejoicing in Gaza City today, my friends. Instead, there are funeral marches, father's anguish, and mother's grief. Let me go one step further than Chomsky. Yes, the ravaging of Gaza by the Israelis is not war, it's murder. But even more, it's the continuation of what supremacist Judaism offers the world, the annihilation of life itself. Divine life came to Jewry 2,000 years ago in the person of Jesus Christ, God incarnate, and the Jews sentenced that life, that divine life, to death. By wicked hands you crucified him, St. Peter reproached the Jews on the day of Pentecost. The entire world is once again being shown in dripping blood and shattered broken bodies what the hands of the chosen lust to do. And while the masses boy in the White House is flying off to Burma, the Jews in their wonderful little democracy 
are executing another death sentence once again on innocent lives in occupied Gaza. Yes, while well, Obama is halfway around the world fiddling in some fourth-rate dictatorship, the Jews are rushing headlong into hell and dragging the Western world and all of humanity down with them. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our video presentation and definitely ties in with all that we've been saying, folks. We are living in a time of great distress. Repeatedly, I have to tell my audience over and over again, because it must sink in to those first time viewers as well, that we have no way of getting out of this mess. We are continuing down that slippery slope to judgment, to God's wrath upon an entire earth he says that he will pour out his judgment upon all the nations of the world for their rebellion against him. He was going to destroy this earth and heaven age again after he did the first earth and heaven age, going back eons of time. When? When he saw that man was out of control. People, nations were out of control. You see, there was one language then that was spoken. And then the Tower of Babel, Babel meaning confusion, came about. And men thought they were going to find their way from, to salvation from this desolate world system. But they were in rebellion against God. And so God created uh, that Babylonian captivity and sowed uh, confusion, different languages among the earth and different tribes and customs and cultures. God hates ecumenism. God hates inclusivism. God hates this whole idea of one race, of no discrimination, no differences, no called out people like Israel. Why? Because man, and particularly the new man, the communist new man that Gina Rahimondo would like to see encapsulated, is what? Working for a unification, a global union, a one world togetherness that God despises because he says when he comes with the sword, he's coming to divide asunder, not bring together. He created all the races, all the nationalities, and he doesn't hate any of them, but he has a chosen people. And that people is the Adamic, Caucasian, Israelite, Jacobite race today. And America represents the tribes of true Israel. We can see the evidence of that now. Folks, we're out of time. Thank you for watching these programs. Hope you have been edified. If not, so be it. Rick Adams, wishing you all a very good week, and Yahweh bless his elect.